How we doing guys, welcome to the Friday Waffle. Um, I always enjoy this video, um, I enjoy making it, but I always enjoy it because I know it's the weekend. Thank goodness, so I trust you've all had uh, a sort of memorable, uh, enjoyable week. Um, I've been pretty busy at work, it's been sort of hell for leather, but all in all not too bad. Still no uh, update on the sort of permanent job front, um, I think I mentioned I've been made, uh, I've extended my leave to the end of August. Which will mean I have effectively been working my notice for 10 months, which is a bit rubbish, but you know what, uh, I think it's going to work itself out. But Anyway, enough of that. Can't not mention Wimbledon. Um, Andy Murray, um, I don't know if anybody watched the game, uh, or no, it's not a game, it's a match. Uh, watched the match today. Um, got to say, you know, Federer was unbelievable. He was absolutely, I mean, I defy anybody to have beaten Federer today. He just played the perfect match of tennis. Andy Murray, he didn't really put a foot wrong. I mean, a couple of the big points, he had uh, a couple of the big points he kind of faltered on. But you know what, Andy Murray played really well, but Federer was on a different planet. So, you know, um, Fair dues to Roger Federer. Um, it's going to be an interesting match on Sunday, I think it is. So yeah, I'm sure Andy Murray will be back. Uh, he certainly done. Uh, he done the UK proud. Uh, there's always a bit of a standing joke. Andy Murray, when he's in Wimbledon, he's in, he's British, but the minute he's knocked out, he's Scottish. So Andy Murray is now Scottish again. So anyway, yeah, that was that. Now what else? Um, game, not even gaming related. Today is the 10th of June, um, 10th of June, shut up, today is the 10th of July, which was uh, my dad's birthday, bless him, but anyway, in three days time, it'll be the 13th of July, 2015, and exactly 30 years to the day, on the 13th of July, was Live Aid. Now, I'm sure everybody that's watching this video will know what Live Aid was, it was probably one of the biggest outdoor concerts that's ever been staged. Um, it was all to do with uh, the famine in Ethiopia, you know, I mean one of these things, it's one of these things that just seems to be never ending, but yeah, apparently uh, Bob Geldof, it was all over the news and Bob Geldof uh, went to some of his mates and thought we need to do something here. And yeah, I can always remember my mate telling me there was a, a concert in London did a fancy go and I can't, I think it was maybe 20 quid a ticket or something but you know this was back in, this was before I was working full time um, and I remember thinking oh I can't afford it, I didn't really have any idea what it was, all I knew it was it was an open air concert in Wembley um, and I knew you know I couldn't afford the hotels or the buses so I turned it down um, but it's one of these it's one of these events, I mean I know people say they remember where they were when you know um, JFK was uh, assassinated. In my generation, we can all remember where we were when Live Aid was on. I can specifically remember the day. It, obviously, it was a Saturday. I was working in Rulco, um, big department store. I was working, I don't know, I think I was working to five o'clock. I can't remember exactly. But I remember watching it. It came on, I think it was at one o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock. I can't remember exactly when it was. It started, and I remember being a big uh, sort of department store, they had TVs, they had an electrical department and uh, I can always remember um, status quo coming on and it was one of these sort of memorable moments at the time, even as a, what would I be, 17 years old I think I was, I can remember thinking this is a big thing, it really felt like, it felt like the world was had come together to try and do something, you know, they'd come together for the better cause. Um, and it felt really special. I mean, I can always remember, you know, although I was working, we were all sort of like watching it on TV as and when we could. Um, even like customers were watching it on TV. It really felt special. Um, when I got home, I was actually going to a party um, at night. It was one of these uh, house parties that you seem to, that seemed to be really popular back in the 80s. Um, so I remember going to this party and, you know, the TV was on, Live Aid was on and people were watching it, but, you know, again, I've, I've spoke at great length about the whole nostalgia thing and, you know, Live Aid was, 
it was something that was special to me. It, but you know, again, it brings back a lot of happy memories. I was 18 years old, 17, 18 years old. You know, had my life ahead of me. Um, Mum and Dad were still here. You know, it was all about fun. I mean, I wasn't even working full time. It was I was working part time. Computers had just kicked off. It was a really, really special time. But yeah, I mean, live in itself. Um, you know, when you look back, who took part? I mean, who was there? There was Spandu Bali, there was Duran Duran, there was Culture Club, did they? Did they? I don't think they took a part. Um, obviously, Queen, who can forget the epic Queen performance? I mean, they were, they absolutely nailed it. They were amazing. There was, dare I say, U2, I'm not a fan of U2, but they, they came across really well. And the, the famous moment was when Bono went into the audience and he pulled out this uh, girl up onto the stage to dance. Then obviously they it was in Philadelphia, I think it was, they, in America they had their own live aid as well. So basically there was these two global concerts going on at the same time and Phil Collins actually flew, he played a set in Wembley and he jumped in Concord and he flew across um, to Philadelphia and he took part in that one as well. But yeah, it's you know, there's a lot of people who criticise these things and they say, yeah, they were only out to, you know, get, you know, famous and that kind of stuff, um, or improve their sort of like their, you know, public perception, doing their bit for charity. But you know what? I, it, and people criticise it, saying that a lot of the, the sort of money and the food that was raised went to waste. Well, that may have happened, but you know what? It, they still did make a big difference. Um, you know, and I take my hat off to these guys. It was certainly a memorable thing that happened in my life, and I'm sure anybody, you know, who was there at the time probably had fond memories of it. Um, I mean, they have had sort of concerts since then, but I don't know. It just felt, it felt, it felt like something major. It really did. You know, it was, it really was. It was like the whole world had come together to try and do something good to help other people. Um, so yeah that was that so yeah in three days time it's going to be 30 years which I can't believe I mean when I think about it I was born in 1967 the second world war ended in 1945 so that would be when I was born the second world war had finished 22 years before and here we are Live Aid was 30 years ago which is frightening so when you when you can you look at it from that kind of perspective it's bloody terrifying so anyway yeah like listen i've got a few new things here but i'm going to pause it okay yeah i've actually had a complete dearth of questions uh not naming any names mr jamie williamson don't know what happened to you i've only got the one question from uh, kevin but i'll come to that one later on so lucky enough i've managed to come up with a few sort of topics of my own before i start um what have i been doing this week um, I keep saying I've not been playing anything, but I'm delighted to say that's not been the case uh, this week. Excuse me, I'm going to have a wee sip of my finest tea. <sighs> Funny, I never used to really drink tea up until about two years ago. In fact, probably when I started running, I uh, discovered that tea is actually <coughs> incredibly uh, refreshing. So I've kind of got out of the habit of drinking coffee and I tend to drink more tea now. But anyway. Not that you're interested in that. Yeah, what have I been playing? Um, this Far Cry 4 on the PS4. Now this sounds ridiculous. This sounds absolutely ridiculous. I've... <laughs> I've seen this game before and you know what? The front cover annoys me. I don't know what it is. The guy that's on the front, he looks like something from an 80s. Uh, synth band, it looks like some Flocky Seagulls. It just annoys me, and you know I've seen this game, you know, sitting on the shelf, and because I don't like the cover, I've never had any inclination to buy it. One of my mates, uh, Tom, was selling it. How much was it for? Was it 15, 12 quid, 15 pounds? I think it was 15 pounds. Uh, that was including delivery. So I thought I'll take a punt in it. And uh, after my waffle last week, when I've seen that I've not been playing any any kind of current gen games, I thought I'm going to start this. Um, and uh, wow, what a game! I mean, it's I'm probably I'm maybe I don't know two three hours into it. Um, it's a bit kind of like Grand Theft Auto Five, or Grand Theft Auto, I should say. 
you know, you've got to kind of, there's various missions you can, you know, decide you want to go on and that kind of stuff. And I tend to get a wee bit kind of well laid, I tend to kind of not know what to do. But uh, yeah, I think I'm 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 probably only about 5% into the game. But it's, you know, the landscape, the actual game world that you play in is just incredible. Um, I mean, it's, you're literally in this sort of living, breathing world. You know, full, I mean, it's, I think it's, where is it? Is it in South America? I think it's Mexico or something, I think it's called. Or, um, eh, what is it? I can't even remember the name of it. Kairat. Yeah, I think it's in, like, South America somewhere. But, you know what? I mean, it's such a incredible looking game. You don't even really have to play it properly to enjoy it. Um, it's like Grand Theft Auto, you know, you can steal cars, you can pinch cars and that kind of stuff, you can walk anywhere. Um, what is incredible about it, what I really what sets it apart from other games, is it's got all this wildlife in it. So you get stuff like, you know, tigers, I've not seen a tiger yet enough, you get badgers, not badgers, what the hell are they called? The things that smell, skunks, I think you get skunks, you get hyenas, you get wolves, you get deer, you get wild boar, um, you get, what do you call it, rhinoceros, and bloody hell, it's absolutely terrifying when a rhinoceros decides to start chasing you. It's the first time in a, com sort of a computer game, or a video game, whatever you want to call it, um, you don't normally bother with animals, you're, you're never really friend of these animals, but when one of these animals, uh, the rhino in particular, decides to charge you, it just knocks you for six, and it's actually quite frightening because you feel the, the joypad shaking as this thing thunders towards you, but it's an incredible game, really, really enjoying it. Um, if you've never played it and you've got a chance to pick it up quite cheap, go and get it, absolute top game. I mean, it's obviously out on the, it'll be out on, I don't know if it's out on the 360, it's certainly out on the, the PS3 I think, it's also on the PS4 which I've got and it's probably on the Xbox uh, or the Xbone, whatever you want to call it and it's also on the PC so uh, definitely recommend you check it out guys, it's an absolutely tonk, uh, stonking game I should say so yeah that's that, um, one final thing before I start my actual subjects um, thanks to Kevin um, down the rabbit hole, Kevin made a video a few weeks ago um, featuring a a multi-cart for his Vectrex. Now I've kind of been after one, not so much a multi, it is a multi-cart, but this one in particular is called a flash cart, which basically means that you can add games onto the cartridge and play them. So all the kind of new homebrew games that come out, you can just basically write them onto this card, you put them on an SD card and you can play it in the Vectrex. So Kevin done this uh, cracking video, um, I think it was last week, it may only been a week ago, two weeks ago, something like that. and. Uh, he mentioned this cart called the Vec Multi. So I asked Kevin, I said, could you tell me where you got it from? So sure enough, Kevin came back to me. Uh, and lo and behold, about one week later, ding, here we go, the Vec Multi. What's interesting, it's uh, the case is one of these 3D printer things. I notice there seems to be quite a lot of these kind of homebrew, not, not just the computer games, stuff where they actually make their own cases using a 3D printer. Absolutely mental. So yeah, that, that, this bad boy here, it's got a, an SD bit at the top, you can basically put your own games on it. But anyway, I'm going to uh, make a standalone, I'm going to make a standalone video for this because it certainly warrants it. If you're into your, uh, your Vectrex and you want to get one of these bad boys, but anyway, oh, that's for another day. So yeah, right, three topics I have got to talk about, four of them I've actually mentioned live aid already. So the first one, again, this, this was one that came to mind. Um, after last week, sort of talking about nostalgia, as I tend to kind of do on a regular basis, and it was, if you could go back in time and basically revisit three episodes of your sort of video game in life. Now I'm talking particularly about video games because at the end of the day, it's a video games channel. If you could go back and just experience, I don't know, say an hour, and three separate uh, sort of stages of your video game life, what would it be? What would you want to go back to? Um, I've been thinking about this and one of them I would love to go back would be, I think I've mentioned it loads and loads of times, I would love to go back to the computer shop 
that I used to go to, um, Ray's Computer Shop, Ray Agostini, an Italian guy, that he was an Atari dealer. Um, he had this wee shop, it was uh, not a very big shop, but it was, Ray was there before computers really kicked off. I mean, this was, he had his shop before the big uh, sort of department stores like John Menzies and WH Smith, Lasky's, Dixon's, Curry's, all these places that stored uh, stocked games. They didn't stock games at the point Ray can he opened the shop. Like I said, he was primarily an Atari dealer. But you know what, the memories I had, the fond memories I should say, of going up to Ray's shop on a Saturday. And it was, there was always kids and other adults, usually guys. You, you, I mean, you very, very rarely saw any women in these places. They, were, they tended to be kind of male, geeky kind of hideouts. Obviously guys getting away for their wife for the afternoon. But we would go up there and you would just spend time in the shop and you would look at the, look at the, you know, look at all the games that were getting played and if you were lucky Ray would let you play them as well sort of thing. What's really, really interesting was uh, on Facebook, um, I come from a, a district uh, called West Lothian in Scotland. It's between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Now, there's a, a Facebook page, basically, uh, sort of what's going on in West Lothian. And a lot of the time, people post pictures, you know, from years gone by. Now, I actually made a post last week talking about the computer shop, saying, does anybody know what happened to Ray, Does he, is he still alive, whatever, and uh, you wouldn't believe the amount of uh, people that were commenting on and it said, oh I completely forgot all about the shop, oh happy memories, brilliant, that's where I got my first uh, Atari ST, that's where I got my first Atari 400, that's where I used to buy my Spectrum games, you know, um, I'd obviously kind of tickled a, a nostalgia nerve with some people um, and it was amazing the feedback I got, but what was fantastic was uh, a few people had obviously picked up on it and they then linked to Ray's family and indeed his daughter actually came on and says uh, just to let you know my dad's still alive and well he's still you know keeping really well and he actually lives quite near to me um, so I've since added him as a, a friend on Facebook although according to his daughter he doesn't really go on Facebook very much now um, or he, he never really goes on it but it kind of got me thinking, I would absolutely love, 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 love to be able to interview Ray um, on a blimey it's only. Now I know he wouldn't be anybody, he wouldn't be somebody that anybody except myself actually knew. But I think talking to a guy like that would be so interesting. Because this was a guy that was into computers and he was selling computers before computers were even popular. I would love to know the background, you know, where did he come from? Um, obviously, he's, you know, he's an Italian. He obviously came across to Scotland. And how did he get involved in computers? What kick-started his interest in computers? How did he become an Atari dealer? Um, you know, I think he would be absolutely fascinating to talk to. He really would. Um, whether I could, <coughs> whether I could actually get him to to speak to me is another thing. I mean. You know, like I say, he's he apparently doesn't really go on Facebook at all. Um, I've added him as a friend, or at least I've sent a sort of a friend request. So if he does get back to me, um, then I'm going to ask him if I could maybe do a Skype interview with him, something like that. I would love to interview him, even even doing a, an interview over email or Facebook, something like that. I think because he's he's a, he's an integral part of my. Uh, interest in, in this hobby, you know, the video game hobby. It was Ray that really, if it wasn't for Ray, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys. Well, at least it's highly unlikely. My life would have taken a different turn. You know, what turn that would have been, I've got no idea. So, uh, yeah, what was I talking about? So, yeah, I would love to, one of my three key moments, I'd love to go back to Ray's shop. Um, the year would be, I would say, 19... 1983, 82, 83, before the C64 really kicked off, back in the really early days when it was stuff like uh, Epix games, you know, Summer Games, Bruce Lee, all these games, all the real classic American games. I would love to go back and just savour the atmosphere, you know, once again. That would be, that would be fantastic. Um, my second... Uh, 
video games. Yeah, my second video games um, time would be probably. I mean, I'm actually. I would have more than three, but I would have to go for the computer club. Every Wednesday, um, we used to go up. There was a computer club in one of the local schools. Now, I say computer club, it was basically a piracy club. Um, you know, everybody would drag their computers. You had to basically take your own computers. I think the TVs were provided. I'm sure they used to provide TVs for us. But this computer club used to take place in the science lab of this high school. And the thing is, the guy that kind of used to supervise, when I say supervise, he was more like a caretaker. Um, I mean, I don't know whether he knew what was going on. I mean, he just basically used to turn up, open up the school. We would all pile in. I mean, we're all, I was probably one of the oldest guys, you know, I was like 17. You would have all these different kids taking their spectrum. Their, you never got any BBCs. There was never any BBCs taken along. Um, probably because they're too big to carry because you had to physically carry all your equipment um, there was always tons of Commodore 64s and there was also one or two uh, Ataris now I'm ashamed to say but we always used to look down our nose at the Ataris the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 owners used to look down our nose at the Ataris because the <laughs> there was only maybe one or two guys that actually used to take and I know this is a terrible thing to say but there was a guy he used to have an Atari and he was actually physically disabled. He was, I don't know where he'd been burnt in a fire or something, but he was physically disabled facially. Now, you know, we, we you know, we never picked on a mind like that. But he had an Atari and the thing is he was actually quite a quite an aggressive person, although you know you could say you could look at him and think, what a, sh a shame. He was actually quite a an aggressive, quite an unpleasant person. And I think because of possibly the way he looked but certainly the type of person he was and the fact that he had an Atari we kind of used to we, I says, we didn't ever make a fool of him we never did that but we kind of used to think huh, Atari you know we were the Commodore we were the, we were the kings we were the Commodore 64 guys we were all the older guys had Commodore 64s the wee uh, sort of Torags um, <laughs> the Torags the younger kids they always had Spectrums um, and you used to turn up there on a Wednesday night, I think it was 7 o'clock it started. And it was basically a piracy club. You know, you would copy games. Yeah, there was always people, people would be playing the games, they'd have games running. Um, but you'd go up there, you'd take a disc drive, and it was a question to just copy as many games as you possibly could. Um, my mate Grant, he had a Spectrum. Um, and because he was probably he probably was the oldest person he would have been like 18 I think at the time he, you know, all the younger kids they weren't afraid of us we didn't, we didn't mean to anybody but because we were older we kind of we were respected and uh, so Grant used to go along there with a C90 and he would basically he would come home you know, I used to take the car I think at that point I didn't, I didn't own a car but I'd pass my driving test so I used to borrow my dad's car um, sometimes, other times I used to walk up well, clutching the TV and that kind of stuff but yeah, we would come back down the road um, I would have X number of discs that I'd copied uh, and Grant always had his C90 so we'd then spend an hour going through the C90 and you never really knew what was on it it was a question of, you know, load uh, apostrophe, apostrophe or whatever it's called, quote marks, quote marks enter, press play then you'd get the wee beep, beep, and up would pop school days. And then, you know, nine times out of ten, the game wouldn't load. So then you would fast forward to that bit. Next bit, beep, beep, night lore. It was one of these, <laughs> it was fantastic. You really had no idea what games you were going to get. You know, you had this C90, you'd maybe copied, I don't know, half a dozen, or probably more than that, you'd maybe copied a dozen games. But by that point, you couldn't really remember what you'd actually copied. There was maybe one or two games that you were desperate to get working, and guaranteed these would be the ones that wouldn't work. So yeah, we'd go down to Grant's, I would drop him off, go into his house for an hour, um, spend an hour or so watching him trying to load games. But then in the back of my mind, I was always uh, desperate to get you know, down the road to test mode games, but I was uh, I was posh, I had a, a C64, I had a, a disc drive, um, and I had this thing called a freeze frame cartridge 
which was basically, it was a cartridge and you loaded the game in, you know, whether it was off tape or disc, whatever, and then you press this little red button and what that would do is it would basically freeze the, it would sort of download the, the entire contents of the memory onto a disc. Um, and, and then when you loaded it, it would just load exactly, it was like a safe state in a game nowadays, you know, it would load exactly as to where you'd kind of save the game at. So I would end up with like five games per disc and what it used to do is it used to put this little kind of turbo loader thing on as well, a wee menu. So you loaded the menu and then you could pick what game you wanted to play but, you know, it was brilliant. It was, <laughs> you know, and uh, anybody that's, you know, maybe 20 years old, all they can, all they can remember now is, you know, CDs, DVDs, broadband, fibre optic downloading games and that kind of stuff you know, and iPads and God knows what. But back then, that was the very, very first sort of daisy piracy and that. You know, computers were exciting. It was really, it was a joy to be alive back then. Um, and it was just, it was an immense time. It was so exciting, you know. You were, like I say, you had the world at your feet. You were just a young kid. Um, you know, life ahead of you. You didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and just being in and around computers... Um, back in the mid 80s was such a fantastic time you know so yeah I would love to go back to the computer club go up to the computer club for one night and just relive um, that whole thing the last one um, I was going to say being back at home mum and dad um, ah you know what yeah I'm going yeah absolutely I'm going to pick being back at home. Um, I'm 17 years old. It's a Tuesday night, and I'm in the in my bedroom, and I'm playing international soccer on my Commodore 64. Um, my mum would come in. Oh, do you want a wee cup of coffee, son? Do you want a piece of toast? My mum would go away and make my piece of toast and give me a wee cup of tea or a cup of coffee. As it was, it was always coffee I drank when I was younger. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I've mentioned before, my mum and dad are sadly, they've passed on. Uh, my dad died a couple of years ago, my mum sadly died back in 1998. Um, so I've not had my parents for quite a long time. Miss them dearly, I really do. Um, and I would I would love to be back, back in my bedroom for a, an hour, to have experienced that, that feeling of just happiness. Um, I mean, my mum, my dad had absolutely zero interest in the computer. Um, he wasn't interested at all. My mum, <laughs> bless her, I mean, my mum, she used to, my mum was one of these people, she would, you know, and it, it sounds like an old cliche, but my mum was one of these genuinely, really, really nice people. She'd never say a bad word about anybody, no matter what or who she was talking to or what she was talking what people were talking to her about she would almost she was always uh, express an interest so when I got my Commodore 64 I can always remember the first day I got my Commodore 64 um, I had a black and white TV and I said to my mum look do you mind if I, if I come upstairs with it for a wee while because my dad was at work I think my mum says well yeah you can come up and you can plug it into the colour TV for an hour but you're only getting an hour and then you need to go back downstairs and I put on, the, the two games that I owned was a, both games by Interceptor Software was Crazy Kong, which I looked at a, in a mashup, I think it was mashup number two, I think it was. Go and check it out, it's a bloody awful game. Um, and a game called Frogger 64. And I put these games on and, you know, I was so excited about having these video games on my own TV. Here was a you know, I could now interact with the TV. And I can remember letting my mum see it, saying, oh, look at this one, what do you think of this? And she's sort of laughing, she's laughing, oh, that's, that's great, son, that's great. And I could tell she wasn't remotely interested, but she was the type of person, she would always make you feel like she was interested what you were had to, what you had to say. And it's the same way when I got games like, uh, I'm trying to think, like, uh, what the hell would you call it? Hyper Sports on the Commodore 64, it had the uh, Chariots of Fire music and I remember getting my mum downstairs in the bedroom and saying, oh, listen to this mum, listen to this. 
and she thought she says, "Oh, that's great." She thought this was fantastic. She probably didn't. She probably thought it's rubbish. But my mum, being the type of person that she was, she told me how she thought this was great. So you know, I used to love showing her games. I remember showing her fin uh, Forbidden Forest, and she thought this was amazing looking. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely give everything I've got um, to be back, back at home, be 17 years old again, back in my bedroom, Commodore 64. Uh, the Wii Elite poster was showing you all the ships was on the wall. Um, we I don't know, 14 inch uh, colour TV, was it Pi? P Y E made it, I think it was. Um, yeah, that'd be special. I would love that, would be my third. Um, when I say third, you know, the, the, the other two that I've picked, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any other one above any other one. Um, but that would be my third uh, pick. Of uh, sort of memories, you know, a time when I could go back and relive just for an hour. So, yep, it would be Ray's Computer Shop for an hour, Computer Club at Inveramont High School back in 1984 85, and back in my bedroom in 1985. Yeah, the fourth one, um, which is probably a bit, um, o a bit obvious, I would say, is to be down in Blackpool. In 1984, in an arcade, um, with just the, the noise, the buzz, the flashing, flash. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, the thumping sound of uh, Space Invaders. <laughs> Who can forget it? Yep. Um, if anybody wants to book somebody for doing sound effects in video games, yeah, just to be back in that that time to experience what it was like at the height of the arcades that would be that would be a close fourth but you can only pick three so yeah I think what I might actually do is I'm going to actually um, I'm, I might actually make a fact you know what forget it forget it forget it doesn't matter anyway yeah that's that one right that was my first one second one um, playing games late at night. Now, I've, I've touched on that I don't, it's not so much I don't have time to play video games. I probably do have quite a bit of time. Um, I mean, trying to obviously shuffle around a job and spending time with my family. Um, but, when I was a kid, I say kid, 18 years old, um, I mean, I think I actually showed you it before, I, I used to keep a diary um, back in 1985 and I was lucky if I was ever in bed before I don't know, one o'clock in the morning I mean I used to stay up to a ridiculous time I mean there was times where I was up to like two, three in the morning playing the computer and it got me thinking, you know I just don't play video games late at night now whether it's because I'm getting older probably is actually but you know when it gets to midnight I start to think, ooh, I better get to my bed now. Um, yeah, you've got to get up for work, I suppose, so you can't afford to be lying, you know, up till all hours of the day. But I just don't have any... I just, I, I don't know, I just don't have any uh, motivation to stay up really, really late. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of people that probably they, they stay you know, they're in front of their computer, they play video games to 2, 3 in the morning. Um, it's not something something that I've done for a long, long time. Um, again, it's probably just something that you do when you're younger. You know, you've not got any commitments of any kind, so, and probably when you're younger as well, um, especially during the summer holidays, if you're anything like me, you wouldn't get out of your bed until, you know, 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So, yeah, you used to go to bed mega late, and then get up mega late, but Obviously now, you know, I've got a job, I've got a, a daughter to get out, out of bed, get her ready, get her breakfast made, get ready for school. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's not as easy to do something like that, but it's just something that I've never ever, I've not done for a long, long time. Um, I did do it when I was younger, but it's something I've just not really done, and I don't know why. I think it's probably just down to my age, I'm getting too old and long in the tooth probably. So anyway, yep, I'm just going to pause it a wee second, guys. Okay, right, the, the third and final uh, sort of topic I want to 
mentioned, I think I've mentioned this before, it was something, it was a comment I made, um, what was it, Arcade Perfect My Arse, I did an Arcade Perfect My Arse uh, this week, what was the, what was the, what was the game? What was the game I was looking at? Kung Fu Master, yeah Kung Fu Master, by, I can't bloody remember who made it, anyway is it Irem? I think it's Irem. Yeah, Kung Fu Master, um, the comment I made and then I stopped in my tracks because I thought to myself, that's a, a waffle topic. And that was, now that we have access to arcade versions, is there any point in playing home conversions? Now you need to turn the clock back 30 years ago. Um, games, obviously the arcades led what games were made for the home computers. You know, the first uh, sort of generation of computer games, they were all arcade conversions. Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, Asteroids, um, Centipede, Moon Patrol, Gallagher, Galaxian, um, stuff like that. So yeah, the, the home computers always followed what was in the arcades. And that trend continued right through, I would say right up till when? Um, probably when the arcades stopped. I'd probably say early 90s was when kind of arcade conversions kind of stopped. You had your later arcade conversions like, I don't know, Alien 3 and I was going to say Space Harrier but that's not. Stuff like I don't know, Operation Wolf. I don't know, that's probably a later, an earlier one as well but you know, the, the, the early 80s, mid 80s, it was all arcade conversions. So when you know, Year Kung Fu came out in the arcades. It came out for all the, the home computers. And, you know, if, as again, I've mentioned quite a few times, where I live, I didn't have any exposure to arcades um, other than when we went on holiday. Uh, and even then, my mum and dad were never, they were never big into sort of like Blackpool or Scarborough, any of these kind of seaside resorts. So my sort of exposure to arcade games was pretty limited. It was usually, you know, stopping in the M6 services for a pish. Um, my mum and dad would maybe give me 20 pence for a quick shot in the arcades. But because you, you, you didn't get to play the arcade games, it meant I was absolutely abysmal at it. And I do blame that for me being... I mean, some bad at games. I mean, if I play a game... If I play a game for any length of time, I do get better at it. Um, but I'm certainly not... You know, I've got mates who are awesome at arcade games and they basically grew up in the arcades, you know, they lived beside the arcades, they played arcades, you know, at lunch time from school, they probably dogged school, went to the arcades, went to the arcades at um, the weekend, I didn't have any of that. So the only time I got to really be aware of what was out in the arcades was like magazines, like computer and video games, they always had a, a sort of arcade section and it would show you, you know, it, it would kind of do a wee kind of review of the game. Um, and then, you know, things like Zap64, they would tell you that uh, US Gold or Ocean had won the, or uh, what's called, not Ocean, Imagine, they had uh, sealed the deal to, to convert like Green Beret and Hyper Sports, um, Year Kung Fu, stuff like that, Ping Pong. So these are all games that I'd never ever, I'd never played really in the arcades at all. And you know, so obviously you used to you used to read read the magazines, you know, with great anticipation about this game that was coming out. Probably the one that was the biggest uh, I was more excited about than anything else, and that was uh, Gauntlet. The very very first time I played Gauntlet in arcades, it was probably nineteen eighty six. Um. Yeah, 1986, it was the student union in Edinburgh for the Edinburgh University, I think it was Napier University. My mate Paul, he was a student at Napier University and we all went into, into Edinburgh, it was a probably Friday night, Saturday night, whatever it was, and he had a, they had what was called a student union, basically it was a place that sold drink cheap, but you had to be a student to get in. So we all went in the student union and upstairs they had an arcade, I think it was two floors they had an arcade 
and I can always remember going in and it was just, it was a complete sort of sense overload of noise and sound, or noise and sound, they're both the same thing, noise, um, flashing lights. Now the thing is what probably added to that experience was uh, we were probably absolutely pissed out of our head. We used to go out, you know, 17 years old, 18 years old, you went out to get absolutely hammered. So we'd probably had like, I don't know, five or six pints of lager at that point. And we went into this arcade upstairs and I can always remember there's two things that really stuck in my mind in that arcade. Three, actually. The noise of three games. One of them was Jailbreak. It's got a really loud attract mode. Um, if you put it in MAME, you'll know what I mean. It's like, help, help, help. Woo, 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 woo. It's really, the noise is really, really loud. And I can always remember hearing the sound effects of this game. And I, I'd never I'd never even heard the jailbreak at that point. And I remember looking at it thinking, that looks a bit rubbish. But yeah, the, the noise of that game. The second game that was quite loud was the noise of, it wasn't even, I'm sure it was called Russian Attack. It was Greenberry. I'm sure it was called Russian Attack, the version that they had. Um... Again, the attract mode, I don't know whether it's got to an Imagine game, whatever, but it was really loud, really, really, really loud. In fact, I'm talking nonsense, yeah, Jailbreak was Konami. Um, yeah, Russian Attack, I, I'm, I'm talking, I'm getting myself muddled up here. Imagine or who converted it to the home computers. Uh, yeah, uh, Russian Attack, Oblique, Greenberry, they were both, they were made by Konami, as was uh, Jailbreak. So yeah, the sound effects of both Jailbreak and Russian Attack or Green Beret, they were really loud. And the last one was the music and sound effects of this big massive behemoth of a game. And my mate Paul had been telling me all about this computer game. He says, oh it's amazing, it's like Dungeons and Dragons and you've got food and you've got treasure and you've got to help each other, you can you've got to fight one, you know, you've got to fight to try and stay alive. And uh, this game was called Gauntlet. Now again, I'd never even heard of it. I kind of thought it was a bit of a strange name. And uh, they had a four-player um, cab in this place. Oh, excuse me. Something my contact lens. Yeah, they had that a four-player. I don't think they had a, they have a two-player Gauntlet. I don't think you did. And uh, again, it was a noise that was just incredible. So anyway, I'm completely going off topic. So yeah, I played Gauntlet. And I just thought it was the most incredible arcade game ever, you know, multiplayer. Um, there was nothing that had come out, you know, before it that was similar. So anyway, when uh, Zap announced that uh, US Gold were going to be converting it um, to the home computers, I was so excited. I can remember me and my mate Grant were looking, you know, you couldn't wait, you'd get a magazine and they'd buy another screenshot and you used to look at it and go, oh that looks incredible, that looks amazing. And uh, yeah, it was a game that I anticipated so much. And I've got to say, when it did come out, um, I wouldn't say I was disappointed. It was actually a really, really good conversion. I mean, I think most of the, the conversions on the home computers were pretty good. Um, that's probably quite a good game to actually do for uh, Arcade Perfect My Arse. I don't know if I've done uh, Gauntlet. Need to check actually, but anyway, I digress. But I think I have actually. Um, so yeah, when it eventually got released on the home computers, I remember being, you know, thinking, "Oh, this is great." Where it lost the appeal a wee bit was the fact that the arcade game depended on you staying alive, picking up food, you know, so you didn't die, um, or else you had to put money and not die. Home computers obviously lost it because you didn't have this. It was basically infinite coins kind of thing. So, yeah, you know, I was that was an amazing. And then games like Year Kung Fu, um, I'd I'd played the arcade one many moons ago, or I've seen many moons ago. I played the arcade one maybe about a year before it came out in the, on the home systems, and uh, I loved it to bits. I absolutely loved it. And again, you know, I couldn't wait to get it on the C64. And again, it was an excellent version. Um, 
the other game which I think is a cracking conversion is uh, Hyper Sports. I mean, Hyper Sports was good in the spectrum as well, but always had a, always thought that the C64 versions were excellent. They looked really kind of arcade-like. But anyway, to kind of answer my, my uh, topic question, you know, are, are games, are home computer versions still relevant? The reason we bought them, we looked forward to them in the, in the home computers, was because, so I'm just taking my shoe off to scratch my foot. The reason we looked forward to it was because this was our way of getting to play the arcade games that we saw in the arcades. So rather than having to, uh, you know, feed 10p after 10p into this machine, we would have the actual arcade game in our own bedroom and you didn't have to pay for it. So that was obviously the big appeal of arcade conversions. But yeah, are they still relevant? I would say they are. Don't get me wrong, there's some games, some conversions that uh, came out in the in the sort of home computers. They maybe weren't the greatest. I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know, I suppose maybe Greenberry. I know people rave about the they rave about the Spectrum version, I think it was it was it Joffa Smith that wrote that and I've got to say the Spectrum one is really really nice. Um C sixty four one isn't bad, it, it's pretty difficult. In fact the the strange thing is the arcade version I find is actually easier than the home home versions. But uh, yeah you know getting to play I mean I did play the C sixty four one quite a lot but then getting to actually play, albeit own, the arcade one, you know, through MAME, was amazing. So there's certain arcade conversions, I would say, if the arcade conversion was, wasn't particularly good, then having the arcade one um, is awesome, you know, is brilliant. I've, a point I've made in the past is, and I'm going slightly off topic here again, I've always felt that arcade games don't always make good com home computer versions for the simple reason is arcade games they're written to make money they're no different from one of these grabber machines they're no different from these uh, from you know fruit machines, jackpot machines, whatever you want to call them they're designed to make money they're designed to take your money as quickly as possible so you put more money in and then it takes it again and you keep putting more money in. So obviously the uh, the difficulty rating of arcade games is very, very high. So it probably doesn't necessarily make a good home um, conversion because it's too difficult. And I always find that sometimes where home versions fall down. They're just too damn difficult. And it's because the arcade version was difficult but that was difficult for a reason. It was there to make money. But then you do get the, the flip side of the coin about, you know, arcade games being better than home conversions. You do also get the, the flip side on the, on the very odd occasion. The one game which the arcade conversion, sorry, the home computer version, although not as nice graphically, is actually probably a better version than the arcade one. And that game is uh, Buggy Boy on the Commodore 64 they basically rather than trying to copy the arcade I mean the arcade one I can always remember playing it in Bathgate I'm sure it had this big massive massive screen I'm saying massive screen you know we're used to you know 42 50 inch TVs now it was probably like a 32 inch TV if that but it seemed massive at the time but rather than try and adopt the big huge graphics on the Commodore 64 which it probably wouldn't do very well they just they took the, the, the meat and bones of what made the game good um, and they just they kind of reduced the graphics, they made the graphics a lot smaller kind of thing and uh, they ended up knocking out an absolutely fantastic Commodore 64 version which is supremely playable, it's a brilliant wee game um, like I said it doesn't look particularly good but when you actually start playing it you realise what a, a top conversion it is but yeah I do think in some occasions you know, why would you want to play? I mean, stuff like, I don't know, what was the games I was looking at? I, I did a mashup, or not a mashup, I did a, an arcade perfect of, uh, was it Road Blasters? 
yeah, on the spectrum in Commodore 64 and Amstrad, I think in particular, bloody awful, absolutely awful outrun. There's another game. Um, there's really not a good version. I think the PC engine's possibly not bad. Um, all the 8-bit versions, all the 16-bit versions are bloody awful. So having been able to actually play outrun arcade game is amazing, you know, that's fantastic. But then there are, like I say, you know, arcade games, they were made to make money, so they're always difficult. You did get some home versions that had kind of reduced the, the, the difficulty a wee bit, and uh, that sometimes made it a more enjoyable game. You know, some of the arcade games, I can't think of any in particular, but they were maybe too difficult, so, or maybe played a bit too quick. So having a slightly kind of... Uh, cut down version, maybe played a wee bit slower kind of thing, made for an enjoyable game, so yeah, so I would definitely say that um, there are, I mean, there, there are, I've got a meme cab there, I've got basic access to virtually any any arcade game that ever came out, but it doesn't stop me playing arcade conversions on my home systems, because, you know, a good game's a good game, um, regardless of, you know, what. So yeah, there are still games that I do play on the home systems, so yeah, that's that one. And very lastly, I'm probably dragging this out a wee bit guys, the only question I've got is uh, from Kev, uh, Kevin down the rabbit hole, thank you Kev. <coughs> Excuse me, for the Friday Waffle, hi Alan, has any video game ever really impacted you emotionally? Only one game has ever moved me to tears, and that was Journey. But I admit Fallout 3 really packed an emotional punch for me as well. Has any game moved me to tears? Ooh, probably Crazy Kong by Interceptor Software on the Commodore 64. But uh, that, moved, that moved me to tears for the wrong reason. Because it was absolutely bloody awful. But yeah, I know you don't mean that, Kevin. Um, I don't think so. Now... I tend to kind of play games that are, you can dip in and out, arcade games. You're never going to emotionally get attached to Robotron or Space Invaders, Galaxy in 1942. The games that you're, you're more likely to get attached to are going to be games where you build up a sort of a relationship with the character. You know, stuff like Zelda, games that are going to require a lot of investing time. Um, now these games historically we me I tend not to play um, I don't know why in fact somebody actually somebody was talking on the, one of the forums that I'm on and they had a thread and it was uh, what big games sort of left you cold and can you not be arsed playing and somebody was mentioning Zelda and what this guy actually said I can't remember exactly what he said in fact I'll tell you I'll tell you in two seconds exactly what he said. And I thought that absolutely nails it for me. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Just talk amongst yourselves just now, guys. Yeah, the name of the thread was, if I can find it. Uh, yeah, really excellent games you just didn't get and gave up on or sold quickly. Now, one of my mates made a statement here and it absolutely nailed it for me. If I can find it. Um, next page. Doo -doo -doo. Humble apologies, I should be here very, very soon. Um, come on. Where are you? Where are you? Yeah, this is it. One of the guys said here, um, Between kids and work, I have barely time for gaming, so playing the same game for months becomes a chore in itself because I'm missing out on the new stuff. And that's probably a huge reason for me not playing games that require a lot of investment. Um, and it's the same with watching films or not watching films. If I've got a spare evening, my wife's maybe out, and like, you know, whatever. I think to myself, oh, I could watch a film or I could play some video games and I think, I'll watch a film and I think, well, wait a minute, 
that's going to take up two hours of my time. And I don't want, I think to myself, I could do other things with that two hours, so I end up not watching a film. And it's the same with these games that require a lot of investment. It's probably for that reason. I've just not got the patience, and, I, and I'm quite mean with my time. I don't want to just play one game for months and months. I mean, some of these games, stuff like it's a Mass Effect. I'm sure one of my mates put in like over 100 hours, Skyrim, games like that. It would, it would literally take me probably a year of my gaming time to play a game like that, and I'm just simply not going to do that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, getting back on track Kevin, any game that's moved me, because I don't play many of these games that take up time, one of the games I did play and completed, and it didn't move me to tears, but it really, really drew me in emotionally, and I was like, fuck, I was really, it kind of hit me hard, and that was The Last of Us um, on the PS3, I have got it on the PS4 to play. And I'm looking forward to playing it again. Um, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but it, it hits you hard right in the guts, right at the beginning of the game. And it just it builds up a relationship with certain people. And there's things that happen with people that come in into the game. And it does, you're, you, you feel genuinely sad when that happens. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably the only game that I can think of that... It didn't move me to tears, but it certainly affected me. It got me thinking about it. After I'd finished the game, I was thinking about it for a wee while. So that's probably the only one, Kevin, The Last of Us. And that is on the PS3 and PS4. So, anyway, listen, guys. Before uh, I bore you all rigid, that is it. That's the Friday Waffle for another week. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching it, guys. I hope you all have a nice weekend. I've not got anything really planned. Oh, one thing before I forget... My daughter, who's turning into a right wee gaming geek, me and her, uh, or her and I, I should say, we're going down to a sort of a retro gaming type, Comic Con type, geeky type thing called, uh, in, oh bloody hell, Insanity? Is it Insanity? Is it called? Yeah, Insanity is in uh, Coventry at the end of August. So my daughter and I are heading down there, um, going down Friday night. Going, staying on the Friday night, going to be there Saturday, coming back up on Sunday. So if anybody else is going there, you might want to pop in and say hello. It's the end of uh, August, I can't remember what day it is in August, but it's a Saturday. It's in called Insanity, I think it is. Sort of a, a retro gaming type of event thing. So anyway, listen guys, enough of my waffle. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed watching it. As usual, I do uh, appreciate all the feedback you give me. Please ping some questions. Right? Before I go, let me think, what can we talk about? Um, let me think the topic for questions next week will be your f your favourite 8-bit software house yeah, favourite 8-bit software house so questions below please but any questions at all about anything even if it's not video game related I'll certainly do my best to answer it. So, as usual, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great weekend.